cryptocurrency markets are very risky. A lot of people are taking on a lot of currency risk right now. And I'm afraid many don't know enough about it. I've been studying currency risk for almost 10 years. Let me tell you what I've learned. The currency market is enormous. The trading volume in the currency market was already $600 billion per day in 1989. Today, it's more than $5 trillion per day. That's a big number. It means that the currency markets trade the equivalent of the US annual GDP in a matter of just three days. We talk about stock markets all the time, but stock markets are tiny in comparison. The trading volume on the currency market is 18 times bigger than the trading volume on the stock markets all over the world. Now, this market is enormous, but to many people it's puzzling. Exchange rates seem random. We like to think about exchange rates in terms of purchasing power. We think of the price of a Big Mac in different countries and different currencies. In the long run, exchange rates should adjust such that those prices converge. Yeah, sure, but only in the very long run. In the meantime, how do we think about exchange rates? Well, thinking in terms of currency returns, that helps. Because the stock market is a little bit like the currency market. So let me say a few words about the stock market first, and then I'll come back to the currency market. Here's how the stock market works. Let's say you start with some dollars in your pocket. You can buy a stock. If the price of that stock goes up, you make money. If it goes down, you lose money. That's simple. Now here's how this currency market is supposed to work. Let's start again with some dollars in your pocket. But instead of buying a stock, now let's convert those US dollars into some foreign currency. Austrian dollars, for example. Now with the Australian dollars in hand, let's do something, but without risk. Let's lend the money to the Australian government for one month, buying a one month treasury bill. We know exactly the exchange rate between the US dollar and the Australian dollar today. We know exactly how much the Australian government is gonna pay us back. But what we don't know is the value of the Australian dollar one month from now. If the Australian dollar appreciates, we'll make money. If it depreciates, we'll lose money. Now we can do something even better than this. Instead of just playing with the dollars we have in our pockets, let's borrow. Let's borrow a lot of money. And since we're borrowing, let's pick a place where interest rates are low. Japan, for example. So let's borrow a lot of Japanese yen. And with those yen, let's buy some Australian dollars again. We can lend the money again to the Australian government for one month and collect the interest rate payments in Australian dollars. We know the interest rate we need to pay in Japanese yen. We also know the interest rate we're gonna get in Australian dollars. We know the exchange rate today between the yen and the Australian dollar. But what we don't know is the value of the Australian dollar at the end of the month. Again, if the Australian dollar appreciates, we make money. If the Australian dollar depreciates, we lose money. We can do this with billions of dollars. You know the size of the currency market now. Economists thought, hmm, that cannot work. That strategy cannot have a non-zero payout. If it were so simple, people would borrow a lot in low interest rate currencies and invest a lot in high interest rate currencies and interest rates would converge. If they don't, it must be that any difference in interest rates is actually offset by the same change in exchange rates. And economists actually have a name for that. They call it the uncovered interest rate parity, or UIP. The change in exchange rate should be equal to the interest rate difference. In other words, there should be no expected profits on currency markets. But that's not what happened. In the real world, the change in exchange rate is not equal to the interest rate difference. UIP doesn't work. 
it took economists a long time to realize that UIP is not a good description of the world. It took them almost 250 years. The oldest account I know of UIP dates back to 1740. It appears in the most famous pamphlet in colonial monetary history, written by William Douglas, an MD in Boston, perhaps not the best doctor in town. He was against smallpox vaccination. But let's leave that aside. In 1740, people used paper money and silver. And Douglas realized that when more money was printed, the price of silver went up, the value of money depreciated. Douglas also noticed that lenders tend to ask for higher interest rates for loans to be repaid in paper money and for loans to be repaid in silver. And he said, it's all fine, it all makes sense. The difference in interest rates should be equal to the expected rate of depreciation of money. That was the first account of UIP, 1740. And the idea traveled through time. Now it shows up in every undergraduate textbook in economics. It's actually usually the first thing students learn in international finance. But at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, economists began noticing that UIP doesn't work. And for the last 30 years, we've been wondering why. Why UIP doesn't work. Why the change in exchange rate is not equal to the interest rate difference. Our research explains why why UIP doesn't work. It's a difficult question, but it helps to think in terms of currency returns. Because as soon as UIP doesn't work, there are potential returns. As soon as the exchange rate is not equal to the interest rate difference, there's a way to make money. And this, as you can imagine, was not lost on everybody. A lot of hedge fund managers started borrowing in low interest rate countries in order to invest in high interest rate countries. And now, this is such a popular strategy that it has a name. It's called the currency carry trade, and it's everywhere. In Japan, for example, there are more than 4 million brokerage accounts that let retail investors just do that, the carry trades. And they place those currency bets with very large amounts of leverage. 25 times their wealth if they want. But the carry trade is not just about currency speculators. Take Poland, for example. 60% of the mortgage market is issued in euros or in Swiss francs. Why? Because interest rates in the euro area or in Switzerland are much lower than interest rates in Poland. Homeowners in Poland don't think of themselves as currency speculators. They don't think about the carry trade. But that's what they do. They borrow where interest rates are low and they invest where interest rates are high. That's just a form of the carry trade. But the carry trade doesn't only happen abroad. In the US, according to the statistics of the US Treasury, the major FX brokers are short $300 billion of a bunch of low interest rate currencies. And the US dollar itself is a low interest rate currency these days. And a lot of foreign companies noticed. And they now issue debt in US dollars instead of issuing debt in their own local foreign currencies. The amount of US loans issued in US dollars outside the United States has increased by 50%, according to the Bank of International Settlements. There are now more than $9 trillion of such loans in US dollars outside the US. So let's pause a second. All those people all over the world playing the carry trade, all expecting nice profits. This cannot be the end of the story. We know there is no free lunch. So where's the risk? With some quarters and some colleagues, we've been trying to quantify the risk over the last 10 years. And it's not an easy task, because exchange rates look so random. If UIP worked, the world would be simple. It would look like this. Change in exchange rates would line up with the interest rate differences. But it's not the world we live in. 
The world we live in is like this. Changes in exchange rates do not line up with interest rates. On this graph, each dot is the one month change in exchange rate. Each color corresponds to a currency. What's the most striking pattern? There's no pattern. Exchange rates look random. So why not try something different? Let's think about currency returns the way we think about the stock market returns. When we analyze the stock market, we think about portfolios of small firms versus portfolios of big firms. Value versus growth. Let's do the same thing for the currency market. Let's start with a large data set of currencies. 15 countries, 15 developed countries over the last 30 years. And let's look at the one month exchange rates on all those currencies. But instead of looking at each individual currency at the time, let's form portfolios of currencies. Here's the way it works. We start from the universe of all currencies. And every month, we sort them by the level of interest rates, from low to high interest rates. And we allocate currencies into the five portfolios. Low interest rate currencies in the first portfolio, high interest rate currencies in the last portfolio. And we do this every month, just like this. And every month, we sort again all the currencies by the level of interest rates. And we allocate them into portfolios, just like this again. And you see, not always the same currencies that end up in the first portfolio or the last. But the first portfolio always has the lowest interest rate currencies. And the last portfolio always has the highest interest rate currencies. Now let's look at the properties of those portfolios. Let's think about the returns of a US investor who borrows just for one month and then invests in all the currencies in each portfolio. Let's look at the average return for the US investor. Building those portfolios reveals some patterns. Here's what we saw. We saw differences in average returns across portfolios, but we also saw, saw difference in dynamics of those returns. Let me start with the average returns. Average returns tend to increase from the first portfolio to the last. Low interest rate currencies tend to offer low returns on average. High interest rate currencies tend to offer high returns on average. There is a clear pattern here across portfolios. Now, if there are differences in returns, there must be differences in risk. There is a simple but powerful idea in finance. Investors should be compensated for the risk they take. So some strategies offer high returns on average. They should be risky. Those strategies tend to pay badly in bad times. Other strategies offer low returns on average. Those strategies are less risky. They tend to do well in bad times. Now the question is, what are the bad times for the currency markets? It turns out that the stock market gives the answer. You know, in the stock market, there are times when prices don't move much. We say the volatility is low. There are also times when prices move a lot. The volatility is high. Those two different times have very different implications for the currency market. Let me first remind you the average returns on the currency market. Low average return in the first portfolio, high average returns on the last portfolio. Now we see why the carry trade is so profitable. Carry trade is about going short the first portfolio, going long the last portfolio, borrowing in low interest rate currencies, investing in high interest rate currencies. But now let's see. Let's see what happens in times of crisis when the volatility is high, two standard deviations above its mean to be precise. Here are the returns. The first portfolio does well, the last portfolio does very badly. What's going on? Low interest rate currencies appreciate, high interest rate currencies depreciate. What does it mean for the carry trade? Well, think about it. 
The carry trade is about borrowing in low interest rate currencies. They appreciate. Mm, bad news, you have to reimburse more. What about the high interest rate currencies? Well, if you're into the carry trade, your wealth is there. And it shrinks. Bad news again. You lose money on both sides of the trade. You lose money in bad times. That's why the carry trade is risky. That's also why it pays well on average. So what do we learn from this? Well, we started from individual exchange rates. They looked very random. But as soon as we built those portfolios, we see that they are not random. There are some clear patterns. Returns increase on average from the first to the last portfolios. But in bad times, the last portfolio incurs some large losses. The first portfolio is an insurance. That's the logic of the currency market. But it's the same logic as the one we usually use to study the stock market. You cannot imagine, however, how difficult it was to convince people that the same idea applies to the currency market. And when I started working on this, the returns on the carry trade look so good. Here you see the cumulative returns on the carry trade. If you start with $100 in 2003, you have $170 in 2007. Where's the risk? Well, in 2008, we had the largest recession in the last 50 years in the US and in many developed countries. The volatility on stock markets worldwide spiked. And here's what happened to the currency markets. Your profits went from 100 to 170 and back to 100. In other words, if you want to enjoy large returns on average in the very long run, you need to be ready to lose money in bad times. That's a simple risk logic. Exchange rates can be highly profitable, but they are also highly volatile. Of course, I cannot tell you when the next crisis will happen, but I can tell you what's the most likely pattern when the crisis hits. The high interest rate currencies will depreciate. The low interest rate currencies will appreciate and carry trades will lose money. That's the most likely pattern. So what's the bottom line? Exchange rates are not random. It's much worse than that. Exchange rates are risky. Thank you.